You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests every week. And my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's also available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. That's always appreciated. And I always like to mention I do do a gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude uh, coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or as you can see on the YouTube uh, channel, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. And you can also reach me at david at thatgratitudeguy.com as well.com. So, and those, sh- those shows will be in the things will be in the links as a matter of fact, too. So, so let me get on with the show. And always, I say this every week, my favorite part of the show is my guests. I'd rather hear a lot more about them than hear from me. So let me tell you today about my guest, John Flora. John Flora joined NACM, which is the NASA Association of Credit Management in 2012. With a 30 year career in senior executive roles in higher education, healthcare, and other nonprofit organizations in the Pacific Northwest. His experience includes chief executive positions with the Independent Colleges of Washington, Child Haven, and the CHI Franciscan Foundation. He has led and rebuilt associations and development programs that have generated in excess of $150 million in revenues. He also brings a background in organizational and financial management, facilities planning, corporate and foundation relations, marketing, public relations, and community grant making. As part of the educational programs at NACM, John hosts a podcast called Ask the Experts. The program focuses on answering questions and solving problems being experienced by commercial credit professionals. And I was actually on that, and it was very neat the way he's put that together. You can find this series on YouTube at, quote, Ask the Experts, N-A-C-M, end quote. John is a graduate of Whitworth University in Spokane and makes his home in Vashon Island. John, welcome to the podcast. Greetings, my friend. Thank you. So nice to have you on here. So as you probably already know, being a faithful follower, the first question is tell the listeners and or viewers on YouTube how you and I met. I probably shouldn't say prison, huh? (laughs) That would not be appropriate. (laughs) Not true either. Um, We met in 2015. And I had been invited to a conference, uh, it was a building conference up north of Seattle, and I brought a couple of my colleagues with me. And on the drive up there, I was dreading it. I was going because a customer had invited, had invited us, but the opportunity to listen to some guy talk about gratitude was just probably more than I could handle. And uh, I was talking with them on the way up saying, this, you know, one more, one for, one more warm, fuzzy speech is probably going to do me in. Uh, but we got up there, we had great food, and then you talked for an hour, an hour and a half, and the room was silent. No one was leaving to hit the restroom or check their phone, and you could have heard a pin drop. And we were doing a conference probably eight, nine months later, <clears throat> and one of my uh, associates leaned over and said, we ought to get this guy for our, for our program. So you and I subsequently talked, and now, what, seven years later, we're good yes. friends. Yes, and it's been fantastic, and I so appreciate your support from that day. I remember that very well, and uh, it was at, uh, I think, Marysville, too, Layla, if I'm not yes. mistaken, and I know I've done a lot, but some of them really stick out. I remember meeting you, of course, too, and um, and everything has led to that, which has been fantastic. So, and then, and then since then, you've spoken to, let's see, the one conference in 16, we've had you in Hawaii, we've had you here in Seattle, uh, you've done webinars for us, so there's a lot of give and take in our members and customers have very much appreciated the uh, <clears throat> information they've learned from you. So I thank you for your contribution. Thank you, John. And I've just I did a talk earlier today. And so it's always kind of fresh in my mind where certainly the pandemic changed everything. And so I'm pretty passionate, as you know, about the subject of gratitude, but maybe now more than ever, just given the 
the stress and, and trials and tribulations we went through from March of 2020 till today and so forth. So but I just said to you offline, uh, thinking about a lot of the things that you've done. And one of the things that fascinates me about your career, which I want you to start off with, is I think when somebody said something about the five regrets of the dying, one of the things they said is, I wish I'd taken more chances. And one of the things that people don't take enough chances, in my opinion, is their careers. And when I was growing up, and I'm older than you are, but I still remember how many people, 50 years, a gold watch, and an off to the nursing home never stayed at the same ABC bank or whatever. But so talk about kind of your career path, maybe sort of mid-20s on after college and that kind of thing, because again, there's been two or three major differences you've had. Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> when I got out of college, I, I graduated uh, in 1978. The economy was atrocious, not, not unlike what we may be experiencing now in some ways, mm -hmm. but we truly were in a, a recession. There weren't a lot of jobs to be had. And fortunately, my college president at that time uh, was someone I'd gotten to know over my four years, and he took an interest and made a few phone calls. And so I got a job coming out of school. Mm. I didn't get paid a lot, but I got a job and I learned a lot from it. Um, and then ultimately, a couple of years out, had an opportunity to go back to work for my alma mater. I did not intend to do so, didn't really want to do so, but they had some challenges there that they were trying to meet, including uh, building a capital campaign for, the, for what was going to be a 100-year-old institution at that point, and they'd never been able to do one of those successfully. Wow. So the fellow that called me, who probably if he called me today and asked me to come to work for him, I probably would. Um, I have wow. that much respect for him. Um, he, he said, you know, nobody's el nobody else has been able to do this. Maybe you can do something different. And I was quite a bit younger than everyone at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I went back and 11 years later, I left, we wrapped up the campaign. It was successful. And then from there, I did, I, at the time, it, when it was over, it was really time for me to go do something else. And I felt like it was time to come back to the west side of the state from Spokane. Uh, and as soon as I got here, uh, the association of all the private colleges and universities came a calling. And I wasn't doing anything. I had a few months there when I was unemployed and doing a little bit of consulting work and what have you. And they called and said, would you be interested in coming to take over for the gentleman who's retiring? Mm. And, and my immediate reaction was no. And then we talked some more and I went, well, okay, let's give it a whirl. And uh, 10 years later, I left. And so from there, it's just, there's been opportunities that have arisen from these various experiences. Not all of them good. Uh, some of them, uh, matter of fact, just the opposite. But, um, and, and none of this really has been planned. Uh, I, I probably, if I had a way to plan my career a little better, it might be, uh, things might have gone a little better during some of the tough times. But I learned a lot from those things, and I don't really have any regrets. Uh, certainly, if I was 18 starting over, uh, that would be different. But uh, when the current position came along, it was something that I knew very little about. I knew about associations, and I knew how to fix them, but I didn't know much about this particular one. And so there was a, a learning curve, and there was some things that really needed to be fixed right away. And that's gotten done and we've had a very successful decade. Um, and so that sort of has me thinking about what could be the future, but I don't, I don't know the answers to that one yet. Yeah. And, and you and I, I know we talked about that last week uh, at lunch. And I think it's, it's interesting. The reason I think it's, there's some really interesting takeaways to me from what you just said. Number one is I didn't really necessarily look for this. This kind of found me and so forth. And that's only possible, in my humble opinion, if you're doing the kind of job that people notice. And well, this guy over here, he's doing it and if he's not in, and I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but it was one of the most fascinating things I learned about my 14, 15 years at Nordstrom is that they don't, you don't apply for a job, they pick you. And so, and yeah. the thought was, is, well, we need a new department manager. We need a new store manager. We need a new buyer, whoever it is. So they ask a bunch of people. And when they hear the same person's name three times, you're the new person. And they would, and I got seven or eight promotions there in a dozen years, 15 years. And, and it was weird because they'd call you, what time is it? Three o'clock. Okay. Be in the new store tomorrow morning, eight o'clock. Congratulations. You know, but that's because your reputation kind of set the table for you. And so I, I see that as happening to you where people are coming, we need to get John out here for this job. But, but let me jump back a second, back to the uh, Whitworth part. What was it about, because I think these things are always instructive. 
what what was it about when he says to you, well, nobody's had more, let's give it to you, this capital campaign. What is it that you were able to do that hadn't been done before? It sounds like they were just almost like ready to, to shelve it and we're not going to get any money. What was it that made you successful on that capital campaign? Uh, you know, I it, it sounds maybe a little cheesy, but um, I had a I had a remarkable experience uh, going to school there, and it and sometimes I I, I I sort of think of myself as a bit of a poster child. I really enjoyed my four years. Mm. Um, it, again, it wasn't perfect the whole time, but at the end of the day, I had a great experience. I learned things. I had opportunities to do things that uh, I might not. Uh, otherwise have had and so when somebody came to say would you essentially would you like to come serve uh the the uh, alma mater uh yeah i was because i could speak directly to it i knew what i got out of it and the things that i was grateful for and i wanted that to continue and so i think that's really what drove it um maybe sometimes i was a little more, more passionate about it than it was about me but that's you know that's okay um, and what's interesting is the success of those years has continued to breed success for the school. And it's a wow. very, very different place today than it was when I left in 1991. And it's very exciting. Mm. Um, you know, for a small college, they're doing ex exceedingly well. And they've wow. had great leadership. And, um, you know, some of those leaders I would have liked to have worked with. But it was really time for me to go when that was over and kind of watch from afar. So I'm still involved as a donor and I'm the mom. But um, yeah, so that, there's your answer. Yeah, I think that's it's really neat. And I, I think, too, when I, I you can't help it sometimes when somebody says something, you, you reflect back on your own experience. And when I was going to University of Washington, um, my folks had gotten divorced. And so they weren't going to pay for any college. So I had to do it myself. And so I worked full time and then went to school and graduated in four years, but it wasn't really fun because I worked so much, you know, and I had to work 40 hours. I was working at the university bookstore and so forth, but what made it at Whitworth, because I don't hear people always say that as much, but what made it so much fun during, you said you really enjoyed it. And that sort of gave you that perspective when you came back, what made it uh, so enjoyable? You know, I had the, the, Good fortune. Um, my my dad had to work his way through college and during the war years in the forties, and when uh, after Pearl Harbor happened, he uh, wanted to join the Navy. He was in there for about two weeks, and they found out he had some health issues, so they booted him. Mm. And I think he regretted that till the day he died. Oh, wow. But um, but he went to he decided to go to school, and his father was not in a position to help him. And so he worked his way through school and swore his kids never would. Mm. So he and my mom saved up the money. So my brother and I had opportunities. And so, you know, the deal was we'll pay the tuition and room, uh, room and board, but you buy the books. If you want a car, you buy the car. If you want other things, that's your problem. <clears throat> so we always worked. And so I worked a lot in the summer. I had jobs in school, but the, the big nut was covered. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me to get involved in, a lot of extracurricular stuff that I might not have been able to, you obviously weren't. And so I'm, I'm grateful because I met some interesting people through that, had some really interesting experiences mm -hmm. and, and had fun um, learning it. And it was a learning experience. And, uh, and so that's probably driven some of the things that have gone on in my career. I mean, the, the chance to to work hard, see the benefits of it. And I think that becomes fun in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. That, and I'm so happy for you. As I say, it wasn't quite the same for me. It wasn't terrible, but it was just that I was so busy getting over to, to the job to make the money to make sure I paid for it and so forth. But well, and I had some, uh, I had a, a roommate who he had to, he had to work for everything and mm -hmm. his folks weren't going to help him. They didn't believe in helping him. They really didn't want to help him. Mm -hmm. And I think he had a real strained relationship, but he had jobs all the time. He took out the loans and it was brutal. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I, you know, I, there were a few times I asked if I could help him in any way and he, he wouldn't do that. Wow. Uh, but today he's a successful attorney. Uh, again, not without challenges in his life, but he's done well for himself and, mm -hmm. um, and he's gotten his loans paid off and done everything you're supposed to do. And his kids went, his kids went to Whitworth and he covered the tab. Um, and wow. I think you know, wow. he learned from his lessons. So yeah. as we all do. Yeah. <clears throat> I always think that's an interesting thing, that whole 
if you have the means, just having watched people grow up and raise their children, and I'm on the east side in Bellevue in Seattle, but whether it's Bellevue or uh, Medina or Broadmoor, anything, there was a lot of money. We've got a lot of high-tech money here in Seattle, uh, Amazon and Microsoft and so on and so forth. But what's the best way to, I would actually be curious about your opinion. Do you give the child a full ride? Do you tell them you'll pay half of it? Do you tell them you, you'll pay the basic thing, but they pay the books? What, what's kind of been, so having been around the college world, what do you think has been, if it's possible to say, the best formula for how you put a child through school, free ride to everything, pay for everything, make them pay for everything? What, what's your opinion on that? You know, it, it obviously everybody's circumstances are different, but, and as you and I have talked about this, I think I was 13 or 14, something like that. And the school year ended and I came home and my dad said, what are you going to do this summer? And I said, well, I'm you know, going to hang out with Dave and Tommy and all my friends and have a good time. And he goes, no, maybe it's time for you to like cut the lawns in the neighborhood or make a buck and learn what that's all about. And so early on, you know, I went to work and it wasn't long before uh, my brother and I were painting houses and, you know, he did it for a few years and I worked for him and then he went off to college and got married and I took it over. And so for five or six summers, I painted houses in, in Tacoma mm -hmm. and I made a lot of money and I worked my tail off and I had two crews working for me and we were all the same age. And that in itself was another great experience because it took a lot to keep that on. And I have to admit that today I can't stand painting. Uh, oh, but if, yeah. I, if I had to go back and do it again, I could. Um, right. If, if I was destitute, I could go paint houses again. Uh, it probably, I, I don't know that I'd rebound as much. I'd probably be sore all the time, but, uh, uh, those were good experiences. So when, you know, when it was time to go to school, I'd already bought my car because I earned it and I took care of my car because I earned it. And then the, my folks made the, the base offer. And, um, there was a point, I don't know, I think I graduated, but I can remember a point where my dad had had a career change and money was a little tight. And I offered him, I offered to loan him some money. And he goes, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. And I said, well, why not? If you need help, ask. Um, and, you know, I was grateful for what he'd done for me. I wanted to return the favor, but he wouldn't take it. And uh, it was only after he passed away that I realized how close to the edge they were. But, oh, wow. um, but in any event, um, I, my, I guess from my experience, the, if you have money, and probably here's a, a good story. There was a um, a Whitworth alumnus who was, he had, he was poor as a church mouse as a kid, had worked very hard and made a lot of money in his career. And his daughter was looking to go to school. And at the time they lived in California and um, the, uh, um, the college ran a recruiting bus trip at that time to expose young people to the school. And she came to her dad and said, dad, I'd like to go with, can, can I borrow one of your cars to drive up? with my friend Sally and we'll do that. And he goes, no, you want to ride the bus and meet other kids and have the whole experience. And she said, but dad, you know, we can drive up. We'll be safe. We'll be okay. And he said, no, you're going to take the bus. And she goes, but dad, we're rich. <laughs> and the room got very quiet. And he said, no, I'm rich. You're taking the bus. <laughs> and I remember that like, it, like it's yesterday. And it's probably 30 years ago now, 40 years ago, but um, there was something good to that. And again, I think he made the kind of deal that I had. We'll pay the basics, but you're going to get a job. You're going to earn some of these things. And it's not all a handout. I think you learn if you don't have skin in the game, yeah. you don't appreciate it. Yeah, that's why I think that maybe the, the word hybrid gets used a lot, but maybe it's a hybrid of, of they pay for the, the actual tuition and you pay for the books and they pay for room and board and you pay for your supplies or, or something or having at least a part time job. I think back to your painting houses at 13 or 14. Anytime you get a child started into the real world about how you're going to need to make money to pay for things in this world. And if you think you're going to live off the government, you may be able to live off of it. You're not going to have a very good lifestyle if you're living off that or not making money to support yourself. So I think having that early on, I think is really kind of important. And, and so, um, but that, but that makes me, and that's why I just think it's interesting for me. I went through and my grades suffered. I was a three, five student in high school and I was a two, five student in college, but I graduated and I got the diploma and, you know, and I paid for it all myself. And it really, that old thing about, as you said, is true, skin in the game. 
it, it just made me appreciate it at such a higher level. And then I, I think back on experiences. I know we've all had this where we're around super rich uh, people or very rich people, whatever it is. And I remember a couple at Queen Anne and a couple at the UAW, they crashed the car the kid had. And then two days later, they got another brand new car, you know, after they totaled it and wrapped it around the tree because they didn't pay for it. And uh, it's just it's, having that skin in the game is just makes such a big difference. And that's, I think, Carl, both at Nordstrom and other experiences I had in retail, especially a really high end clothing store. Some of the most challenging ones I saw is were how these these parents handled these kids and just gave them everything. And they became spoiled brats and no appreciation for anything and no manners and just all that. And it's just, you know, I'm going to roll out the red carpet for them, but you're not doing them a favor. You're actually making it worse. Yeah, I would agree with that. And it, that you have to make some hard choices as a parent, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, and, I, and I guess when I think back on your original question of when I was in my 20s, um, when I got out of school, again, we were in a recession and it was a pretty nasty one. And 10 years later, I remember being uh, over here in Seattle, watching kids coming out of school in the late 80s, early 90s, getting signing bonuses to go to work for high tech companies. Mm. They were no different than me or you. Yeah. yeah, There was just a 10 year difference and the world had changed a little bit and business was good and people had money. And suddenly these young people were walking around with a lot of money in their pocket. And yeah. there was an attitude that came with that that to this day really bothers me because mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there was a real appreciation by many of them for what they'd just been handed. Um, but, you know, maybe they, maybe they are, you know, years on, but there was just kind of, a, I don't know, I found it, I found it to be very difficult uh, to deal with, but, you know, life is what it is. And, um, you know, we go on. So. Well, I think sometimes there's, <clears throat> this is no substitute for time in the saddle. And I heard somebody say this once, it's like, you can talk about riding a bike all day long, but until you go out into the driveway and start actually trying to ride, bike, we can't just talk about it. We got to get out there and do it. And I think that for me, just having those experiences and it was tough, but you know, I appreciated it. And again, it just is, you look at the people that again, re roll out the red carpet. You don't want to do that, but just seeing how so many of those kids and it was drugs and, and all sorts of problems and crash cars and things like that when they were too given everything and just having that appreciation. And, and that's why I'll never forget that. And, and so, but I want, I want to jump back to something you said earlier too, because I was talking to somebody the other day about the topics. And as you mentioned at the outset about my topic is gratitude and, and is that a warm and fuzzy or whatever. And I looked one day and I saw what are the top topics right now for speakers and there is you know work life management and, and time life balance or work life balance or things like that but the runaway one that has been for there for quite a while is leadership and so you mentioned at Whitworth in particular uh, great leadership was the exact term you used and I'm assuming that was more than one person but so what is in, in that experience, because I think that's an awfully hard commodity to find. And I think about all the leaders and the people I work for at Lowe's and, and uh, Nordstrom. And, and for every one good leader I had, there was 10 bad ones just that didn't understand people. So what made those leaders and then going back to when you were there, too, but what, what made, in your opinion, for great leadership? Well, I'm, you know, again, I, I let's see, I go back with Whitworth to 1970, I think was when my brother went. Mm. Um, but there was the president that was there when I was there was one of the early futurists. His name was Ed Lindemann. He'd come from the space program and was really hired to, um, I think, bring the school into the current world. Small Christian College was kind of mired in some of its old ways of doing things. And so Ed came in and uh, could could speak about the future and got people revved up and thought about it. And he hired really some great people to run the various departments, many of whom went on to uh, higher level jobs with other with larger institutions. Um, but I think along the way, probably the takeaway that I think of is he knew the students. Um, if I walked into his office and asked for an appointment, his assistant would always, she'd figure out a way to you know, even if there was 10 people sitting in the office, sitting in the waiting area, she'd figure out a way to get me in there. Mm. And he always would make time for students. Mm -hmm. um, and that made, a, that made a big difference. And there was a, a guy by the name of Bill Robinson who served as president. I think he's been retired 10 years now, but he was president for 20, 20 years. 
And I remember walking across the campus with him one day, um, probably in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I said, do you know every kid by name? Because he talked to every kid by name, uh, walking wow. across that campus. And he goes, I can remember them while they're here. Once they go across the dais at graduation, I can't remember their name to save me. But that made all the difference in the world. Uh -huh. It's custom, That came down to basic customer service in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I, Right now, I'm kind of on the bandwagon of absolutely hating anybody who has a little chat thing in the, in the corner of their screen. That's mm -hmm. the phone company, the cable company, the airlines, you name it. Mm -hmm. It's rotten customer service. Yeah. And um, and if anybody watching this works for any of those companies, sorry, I offended you, but <laughs> it's a terrible way to work with your customers and, um, knowing who you're dealing with, answering the phone is the best way to do business. Mm -hmm. And it's, we're all in real, most of us are in relationship businesses and that's the way the colleges are. Um, they have to know their people and we have to know our people here at NACM. And so, um, you know, we, we do have that that trait that maybe comes from 123 years of being in business, but it's also my belief that we pick up the phone and if somebody does leave an email or a voicemail, we get right back to them. Uh, there's not going to be any chat thing on our, on our website. You're going to yeah. talk to somebody here yeah. and that's the way it has to be. And so we've had success because of that and hopefully it'll continue to be that way. And I think too, speaking of the chats and technology is that, What's, what's the line in the wedding, something old and new and something borrowed, something blue. It's something like that. I think old and new will always have, again, back to that word hybrid. I think that'll always be part of it because I think there's some things that, yes, technology is fantastic. And there's a lot of things about it that I told both my sons at my age, I told them 10 years ago, I will never be left behind. I mean, I will always be on top of every technology. I just don't want to be that guy. Well, I don't really have an email. What is that? But at the same time, there's some things that never go out of style. And, and you mentioned, like, I think the phone's going to make a comeback. I mean, I don't know the stats, but I think probably most phones are 90% text and probably 5% phone and 5% email or something like that. But it's just become text. It becomes such a big thing. And, you know, the old phone and, and it saves, and I've thought about, even I'm sure I've done this with you, where we text back and forth, let's go to lunch, what date, that doesn't work, this, and you go back and there's this whole big thread of emails, how about just pick up, so what, Friday? That works yeah. really well. Perfect, yeah, great, perfect, <laughs> see you at one, okay, excellent, you know, and so knowing that, though, I think it's really, uh, again, just sort of figuring out what's the, this, and that's why I was, I guess I'm coming back to the leadership thing, I wrote down here, remembering the students' names as an example, and I think that that's one of the things when I was fortunate enough to get the same kind of same, similar to your thing, John, where people noticed you and then they let's get John Flora to do this job or let's pick him up. And you, you weren't necessarily out looking for jobs. They kind of found you. Well, that's as I mentioned, that's how it kind of worked at Nordstrom. And as I look back on that and they would just call you and you're going to you're going to start the new job tomorrow. I think what is it about that? And I think one of the biggest things that I did is not only knowing their names and then sometimes knowing their first and last names and knowing the kids' names and how the soccer game went on Saturday and all that kind of thing and making a point of it. And I talked to a lot of managers that were coming up after me. And so that's not that important. you got more important things to worry about. You need to know the sell through on that penny loafer that's over on this table. And I said, oh, really? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's not exactly how it works. And so I, I just think how we interact with people. And then, then speaking of the chat thing on the deal, where's my cell phone? Is it how many times is, is I've seen people doing this? They're talking, but it's kind of like, so what, yeah, what were you saying? John? And they're, are you looking at your phone right now where you're talking to me? And it's like, how rude is that? And that's why I think another thing that'll never go out of style is just manners. It's just good manners and thank you and please and all that. A lot to be said for that. And yeah. uh, the other, I guess the other piece, and I'm starting to sound like an old geezer, but I really truly believe these things. The phone is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it weighs 800 pounds for some people and they just oh, yeah. can't pick it up. The other part is occasionally doing a handwritten note mm -hmm. and I don't do them as much as I used to, or as much as I ought to, but when, on, on those occasions, when I really feel like it's needed, I have some note cards. I don't have one handy here, but a little note card and I can just jot a quick note, shove it in an envelope, hand address it. And I will always get a phone call back and thanking me. And nobody does that ever anymore. Why do you do that? It's yeah. like, well, you picked up the phone and called me yeah. and that's just a polite thing. It's also yeah. probably good business. And that's part of leadership. Um, I think the other piece of leadership though, is who you're able to hire. 
um, and, and find those good people. And that's gotten really hard to do. Um, I, and I feel for the companies in some way that do the chat thing instead, but trying to hire good people is hard. And I'm doing it right now for a couple of openings and mm. struggling a bit. I have a new employee coming in Monday, which is good, but I have another key person I've got to find and I'm going to revert to a search firm, I'm sure, but it's just harder than it used to be. Um, so in any event, I guess the, the other thing I want, I was just thinking about this uh, when I, uh, moved back to Seattle in 91 or 92 and was uh, asked to join the Independent Colleges of Washington. We represented all 10 private institutions. And as part of that, I uh, was asked to be a member of the downtown Seattle Rotary Club, which at that time was like 750 of your close yeah, personal very big. friends. And it's smaller now, but at, this, at that point, it was still the president. I mean, the president of Boeing was there every week. Mm. We still had bank presidents. We hadn't gone through all the mergers yet. Yeah. And so I was geez, 32, I guess at the time, something like that. And so I knew the bank presidents and I, I knew all these people and they were very nice people. And if you wanted to get something done, it was easy to pick up the phone and call them. Mm -hmm. And they were the leaders of the community. Today, I have no idea who's really leading Seattle anymore yeah. Um, yeah. or any other city for that matter. Right. But those guys were really, and most of them were guys, there were a few women in the bunch, but <clears throat> and I think there's a couple of those still around. Uh, but I, I would be hard pressed to figure out who the community leaders are. And you add to that the sale of the broadcast operations to multi to big companies, they're right. no longer locally owned. We've lost a lot in that. Uh, I mean, we can talk about the effect on democracy and all that. But let's just talk about what is what mergers have done to our communities. They oh. have not been good. They're good for stockholders. Sure. Right. But they're not good for the health of the community. Yeah. And it continues to happen. And I was listening on a podcast today or yesterday on the walk, and it was about all these people that put these uh, unicorns and, and get to the IPOs and all this. And the whole thing is designed to sell the company. You yeah. know, and this is somebody's baby. It's, it's, it's like their own child. And yet they're not considered a success till they sell it and you know, tap into all that money. And some people want to keep running their company. And it's just, but it's mergers and it's big, the bigger ones gobbling up the small ones. And it's, it's really a shame. And, and you're right. There used to be, you know, a dozen or 15 really major banks in Seattle, as an example. Yep. And you could go on every corner and see Washington Trust and see first and whatever it might be, NBFC. So yeah, it's, it's really a shame. And, and I wanted to mention, I'm going to ask you something about NACM. Uh, one more thing on the leadership thing, because anytime somebody says great leadership, um, the other thing that I just, I, I just go back to all the time, it's the golden rule. The people that are really good, they set a good example. And like you said, you could pick up the phone and it's the president of Boeing or whatever, and they would do it and they'd follow through and do what they say they're going to do. And as an example, it's just one of the things, and yes, it's email or whatever, I, I've said this to many people. I'll send out what I call 10 average emails. Can you get back to me on this? I need this. I want to say hi to this, whatever. And on average, I get three or four back. And, and I said to somebody, it's just, it's just such a shame the five or six that don't get back to me. And they said, well, why don't you celebrate the three or four that do? And I said, <laughs> <Be> well, <grateful. laughs> yeah, I'll be grateful for that. But it just, it's just, that's kind of the, the way the numbers are. And it's really a shame because a lot of it is a term I've used for years, a two word term that applied to all of, all of this is just common courtesy. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to, it's like when somebody asks you over for dinner, you don't have to give them an explanation of why you can't make it and your mom's coming to town. You, you just say, I can't make it, but thank you so much. You know, I really appreciate it. That's called common courtesy and things. So, but um, we just got about five more minutes and I want to ask you a couple more things on NACM, the day you walked in there and as of today, in your current, it's I think roughly 10 years, What's the biggest one or two things that that company taught you, that organization taught you? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I maybe have taught it more, but uh, I think one of the, I think the th among the things I've learned is that we're we're a member organization and ha have been for 123 years. Uh, as a society, we don't join things like we used to, mm. and so. Um, you know, whether you're talking about mainline church denominations, uh, golf clubs, downtown luncheon clubs, whatever, yeah. uh, Rotary Club, we don't join like we used to. It's you're not right. part of it. We, you know, I remember my daddy going to the, uh, the Tacoma Club for lunch and meeting up with people there and getting work done and what have you. Um, and we're that way. So we've seen our member involvement drop. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's relatively stable now, but it's, it's dropped. But we have a growing number of companies that want to do business with us. They just don't want to be a member. They don't want to pay dues. And they can get everything we do. They may have to pay a little bit for it, a little bit more. But they, they want to deal with us. Um, and, you know, we have people from all over the country calling us now, not mm -hmm. just here in the Northwest and Alaska and Hawaii. But um, I think that's an interesting lesson and trying. And, and it's also a, a challenge that we have to solve. Um, are we going to modify the way we do business going forward? Yeah. And so that's an interesting question. It's a challenge. It's, a, it's been an interesting lesson to deal with. Uh, I think the other part is I'm, I serve a constituency that, that is relatively, um, uh, what's the word I want? Well, they, they tend to be shy. I guess that's it. They do their work. Uh, credit is one of those parts of the business cycle that is not taught in school, but if you don't get your bills paid, it's because your credit department isn't doing their thing. And so we teach those people, we sell them the credit reports, we help them with collections, um, but they are not always celebrated within their own enterprise. And I find that that's been an interesting lesson to see that because mm -hmm. they control millions of dollars. Uh, when I took this job, my wife said, what do these guys do? And I said, well, think of it this way. The sales guy gets the deal. The credit manager, make sure you get paid. Yeah. And if you don't have that person doing a good job, then you're not going to get paid. Yeah. So um, we're involved in an odd part of the business cycle, but it's a very important part. So yeah. we, I guess I, I, when I came in, I didn't, I don't think I realized just, uh, I get the level of, I mean, how many introverts I was going to be working with. Oh, uh, yeah. And that's not a bad thing. It's just right. what it is. And right. that, that's an interesting lesson. So. It's kind of like the, maybe they get an unfair rap, but the engineers and the accountants just don't generally line up big in the personality department. You know, it's just, that seems to attract that more. Yeah, I have a fun accountant, person. so we're different in that regard. Well, that's, that's good. <laughs> that, that would be nice and things too. So, well, I'll, I'll wrap up and, and uh, I was just looking back at a couple of notes here and back to when you mentioned about that capital campaign and then um, the leadership thing I zeroed in on and learning how to paint houses at 13 and 14 and so forth. And just, I always just like to look back at lessons. And I really like the piece about um, not necessarily looking for a job and people finding you, because I just think that's, that's so much about the example that you set and your actions speak so much louder than your words. You can go tell somebody, I'm a great worker, but somebody, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we just want, and that's why I like the Nords and the last, the people and when the three people say John Flora, they pick John Flora. And I think that's really cool. So um, and then the note cards and remembering the people's names and treating people with respect and, and regardless of your position and so forth. And uh, this is the last thing you just mentioned really struck with me too about nobody's joining memberships or organizations. I remember just in clubs downtown, there was, I think it's the Rainier Club is still there, but there was the Harbor Club and the College yep. Club and they're yep. both gone. And there was, a, I think it was a city club. And then I was a member, as you know, because you were down there with me, uh, Columbia Tower Club. And it's, I I'd since left there and I don't need to have that as a membership as much, but all that, the churches, the golf clubs, rotaries, all that have really dropped. And so it, it's a shame because there's a, a fraternal organization feel to all that and a camaraderie that is hard to get in some of our current configurations of how people interact. You know, Facebook with, doesn't do it. Uh, the electronic exactly. things don't do it. Yeah. And I think it's a, a challenge. It, again, it speaks to the fact that mergers took out a whole layer of, of uh, senior management that was not replaced. Yeah. And it, our, our community suffers for it. I mean, I remember coming home and uh, when I was a kid and even, even now it's interesting that my folks always watched, uh, for anybody here in the Northwest, uh, uh, Como TV, Channel 4, the ABC affiliate for the news. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those got those talking heads were there for years. Yeah. And you could always rely on Steve Poole to give you your weather. That's right. And, uh, and then he retired. And now uh, Shannon O'Donnell's there. And she's actually really a smart cookie, I think. I don't know her, but uh, she does a good job. But uh, uh, if you look at how fast these stations are churning people, yeah. none of them are ever part of the community anymore. That's true. And I think that's a tremendous loss. You know? Yeah, I agree. And it's just, it's a shame. And the only, the only thing I'll ever, I don't want to say caveat, is, is just sometimes I, I say that kind of thing and I think, God, I sound just like my dad. <laughs> but, I, 
I remember thinking, I'll never listen to the music he does, these Hawaiian bird calls and all these Ray Conniff and the band of orchestras or something. And, and you know, now I think the music I listen to, so am I not hip with it? Should I be listening to hip hop and rap or whatever? But I think we all think that, but, but I really feel some of the things you mentioned are just truly really sad things that have happened. You know, the loss of the membership, the loss of the organizations, the whole thing of people not being part of something as much and that camaraderie is is just, again, it's not happening in Facebook. So that's a good yeah. point. So, well, let me ask you, you already know my last question, um, being a faithful occasional listener to the podcast, but it, it still is my favorite question. And that is, what does John Flora know today who would have liked to know at 18 that would have helped him? What would that be? Again, I grew up in a pretty stable family and <clears throat> um, not that we weren't wealthy by any means, but we certainly didn't lack for much. And I had lots of opportunities that I'm grateful for to this day. Probably the lesson I would have liked maybe beat into my head a little farther was that uh, along the way, things aren't going to go well. You could get fired. You know, you could get laid off. Uh, something's going to go south in your life. And um, I, I, you know, I think the first time I had something go sideways was really hard. Um, I dealt with it but it was hard. And then the second time I dealt with it. Um, but we don't, we don't really, you know, we don't, I wasn't, I didn't plan for that. And I don't know that I was given a lot of good guidance that, you know, someday your life could fall apart for a few days. Yeah. And that's the way it is. I know very few people who've, I don't think I know anybody actually, who hasn't had some difficulty in their life. Uh, some have been blessed more than others, but, um, yeah, that's, I guess I would have liked to have known more that more, uh, I guess, to, to be prepared better yeah. than maybe I was. I think that's an excellent, excellent point. And I got all sorts of answers on that, you know, buy Microsoft stock when I was back such and such age. I mean, I love the, some of the things people say and I go, you know, that's not the spirit of the question, but, <laughs> but I think that's such a great comment because it just, it's going to happen to everybody and just, I always liken it to punching your stomach, at least if you can tighten your stomach muscles, you don't, want, don't get the wind knocked out of you. So, but it is going to happen. Nobody yeah. gets out of this thing scot-free. And so just prepare yourself. And I, I think it would have helped me if my parents had maybe made a little bit better uh, the divorce that they had and then later their deaths and things like this is that there's going to be stuff to happen that you're not going to think you can bounce back from, but you just got to hang in there and put one foot in front of the other and a day at a time or all those types of things and it'll get better. But I think most people go through that. So yeah. I think. Well, I think and I, and I, when I was the day I graduated from college, my dad was studying for his real estate license. Uh, he worked for a large company that decided to make some wholesale changes and all the old guys were laid off. He was one, he was 58. Yeah. And so he started a new career at 58, brand new. And he worked till he was 75 and became a very active realtor in the South Sound mm -hmm. and did well, I think. But there were some, a lot of challenges with that at the time he decided to get into the business. Yeah, And he worked probably a little longer than he wanted to and died a year and a half later. And um, you know, that sticks with me. There's no question about it. And I don't seek to emulate that model, yeah. but you know, the NACM board someday could say, we're done with you, get out of here. And now I'm a little better <laughs> prepared to go, okay, well, here's the contract you owe me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, those are, those are all really good lessons. And, um, you know, and maybe sure. we just have to develop that patina over time, uh, exactly. based exactly. on getting beat up a little bit. Yeah, and that's a great point. And I think that uh, I'll, I'll tease it out to the listeners as we wrap up that uh, I'll save it for the next John Flora podcast. And that'll be, as speaking of your father, as you just mentioned him, lessons from your mother. And so that'll be on the Oh, next yes, podcast. there you go. And there are many. There are many. And still and they on, continue. And she's just you know, every single day putting one foot in front of the other. So anyway, well, thank you, John. And as a reminder to everybody, as I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. And I know that people are struggling with all sorts of life issues and they might need support. We've got things going on like anxiety, depression, 
uh, jobs that are struggling with health, financial families, and that type of thing. And I have a gratitude coaching program that can really help people. And I've been really successful with the clients and getting them back on the track that they want to get on. So I offer a complimentary 30 minute, uh, complimentary 30 minute coaching consultation to do some on the spot coaching, and then see if we might be a fit to work together. And if you're interested in that, just text me at 206-371-8309 and put the word coach in the text and I will get back to you. So also people like to receive my weekly Monday morning minute video that goes out every Monday, coincidentally. If you're interested in that, go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828 and put the word gratitude guy, all one word in the message box and that'll sign you up for your Monday morning minute. So thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate you both on the radio and in YouTube and live. And remember what I always wrap up with and that is remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today. 